Welcome back everybody. Our next session is a live interview with BBC's Race Across the World winner, Iman Chowdhury, in conversation with our very good friends at Wanderlust magazine. Iman and his nephew Jamil won the 2020 series of BBC's Race Across the World, in which five teams raced to see who could get first from Mexico City to the most southerly city in the world, Ushua. Iman and Jamil then won the hearts of the nation when they donated most of their winnings to helping street kids in Brazil. If you'd like to ask Iman a question, just post it in the live chat box and Lynn will ask as many as she can during the session. Good morning. And if you're joining us this morning, then it is 99.9% .9 likely that you were as gripped by Race Across the World Series 2 last year as I was. And of course, it came at the perfect time too giving us a travel fix, just as the world, well, and certainly the UK, went into lockdown. And spoiler alert, you'll know it already, but Iman Chowdhury won it with his nephew, Jamil. And I think they really grabbed us throughout the series. We fell in love with them, basically, and felt the emotion, felt them getting closer together. And then, of course, by the end of the series, well, as we know, um, they did the most huge and generous gesture which touched us all. And so it's a huge pleasure this morning to chat to Iman. Welcome, Iman. Hi, Alin, you okay? Yeah, good, thanks. So where are you sitting right now? It's on my couch, nice and settled. <laughs> Buffett, and is that Bradford? Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, Buffett, yeah. I was gonna say, that Columbia ad, that must have taken you back. Yeah. It did actually. When I was watching that Columbia, I, I, the one thing I do remember from Columbia is the colours, the vibrant colours, and yeah, yeah, the ad had it, and that's the best thing that I remember about Columbia. Just especially, yeah. I think it was in Guatape, we had all the houses um, on on the street on different like fluorescent colours, and um, yeah, it was a great advert. It brought brought about some memories. Oh gosh, and you hadn't been to Latin America at all before, had you? You had travelled a lot before, but not to Latin America. Yeah, um, I've never been to Latin America. No, I've, I have been to Mexico about ten years ago, but that was uh, just literally Cancun, and that was spring break, and that was just after university, okay. which was uh, yeah, it's a bit different experience yeah. altogether. <laughs> different experience. Yeah. I bet. So with Race Across the World, I mean, how did it come about? Did you did you see an ad? You know, how how did you apply for it, and why? Yeah. So uh, my nephew applied to it, and uh, he told me that he was applying to it. Okay. Um, it's one of them things um, you, you just don't think you'd get onto it and I've applied to a few things in my time and I told him you know it's, nothing's gonna happen off it and um, he rang me up on the night on the deadline night and he said oh can you do me a one minute video and I, and I told him again nothing's gonna happen so I gave him like a one minute video um, I was actually in, in, in my bathroom when I did the, this one minute video and I sent it to him and then literally a couple of months later they gave us a call and I was just like completely shell-shocked um, it's not something that I was expecting. Um, you know, you, you just think these things don't happen to people like us. But, you know, if you put yourself in the pot, you know, you've got every chance. Why not? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've got to be in it to win it, haven't you? You've got to try. Exactly. But, yeah, as, as we found out straight away with the series, you know, you'd been somewhat estranged from the family. Yeah. You hadn't seen Jamil for was it, over 10 years. So why did he think of you? Why did he want to travel with you? Um, I think I was I was in his head at the time because we I think the week before we were at a wedding together and at the wedding we just like literally chatted for like two three hours uh, just like catching up and it was a really fantastic catch up and um, and the advert I think came on the next day when he was sort of thinking about it so I was in his head at the time and uh, he just imagined like doing it with me would be would be quite kind of good and uh, an amazing experience. Yeah. Oh, how fortunate that he did yeah but how does the program then actually work because um i think we all know that obviously the whole point of this is you've got to make it you know through a huge journey you've got very limited budget you've got no smartphone but for instance when they you know you got the call or whatever they said they were taking you did you know where you were going we had no idea where we we're going uh, prior to the prior to landing in mexico city um, it was all kept hush hush, and even prior to uh, getting on the plane, they made us sign these like uh, visas for like um, I think it was Mozambique and uh, 
Mongolia just to th- throw us off the scent. So when they got us to Mexico City, I was like, okay, um, you know, I've never been like down south, down to Latin America. And I just thought it's just too difficult, it's just too dangerous. I mean, this is the BBC. They don't do dangerous. They must be going back up, back up to North America and doing something up there. But when I realised we're going down all the way down to Ushuaia, I was like, scratching my head and saying, are you sure, guys, you want us to do this? And um, so, yeah, it was just amazing. And it, was, it was a really, you know, shock because I'd done a bit of research thinking of all the places that I could have gone and uh, around the, like, like big journeys. And I just never assumed it would be South America. <laughs> and of course, you didn't have any Spanish, did you? Um, no. No. <laughs> no, nothing at all. I, I, I couldn't do no, no Spanish, Spanish at all. Good old hand yeah. language. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, we, we'll come on to uh, communication, I think, in a bit, because I think I think what really struck us, all of us watching it, was how you and J- Jamil were probably the best out of everybody at mm-hmm. though communicating with locals. But um, and it remind us, you have an incredibly tight budget, don't you? Is it something like twenty six pound yeah. a day? That's right. Yeah. And, so twenty six. Yeah. Yes, twenty six pound a day, um, and that's for everything. That's food, accommodation, travel, um, any other like amenities that we want. So that's everything. Uh, which is actually nothing at all, especially when uh, a bus ride will cost you about $50. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, it was nothing. Yeah, now that must have been one of the biggest challenges. I mean, were you hungry? Sorry, I mean, I've just had my breakfast, so I'm thinking of food. <laughs> yeah. But were, did you get hungry? I mean, were you having to deprive yourself of things like, you know, meals, drinks, uh, you know, and obviously... I'm sure you were going, having to go without showers and things at times. So yeah. how, how much of a deprivation was it? It was a lot of deprivation, to be fair. Um, you know, food was a luxury for us uh, because we spent a majority of our money on travel and, and getting, getting from A to B. Um, so a lot of the days we didn't eat, we would constantly have water with us. And even what, uh, water was almost you know, hard to come by at times. Um, so yeah, we, we, not just food. It was just like sleep as well. Uh, we spent a lot of times on on uh, overnight bus journeys, twenty four, thirty six hour bus journeys, on really horrible buses. So it was tough. Uh, but you know, the things that we had to look forward to was the checkpoints. And as soon as we got to the checkpoints, then maybe we could like you know eat properly and let our hair down and have a wash and you know get back to a bit of normality a little bit. Yeah, because obviously, yeah, the the checkpoints and obviously the way the series mm. ran was you reached a checkpoint at the end of each episode, and it, it always looked, that looked quite luxurious. So yeah. were you typically there, you know, for a, what one night, two nights? Yeah, roughly. Yeah, majority of time just one night uh, usually, and we're back off the, the next day. Uh, but that one night was mm. like amazing after the week that you've had. So it's like almost a week of like traveling rough, and then. Uh, having one night in luxury and then back on the tra- uh, trail. Yeah. And you've, you've obviously must have somebody or some people with you filming you. Yeah. Um, which must be strange as well. I mean, how did that feel? And like, what kind of crew have you got with you? And how did that feel? Um, yeah, so we're given uh, two producers uh, that carry cameras. And then we've got like a, a, a security person and a sound person that travel everywhere with us. And you can imagine, you know, everything that we did, they did. Every bus that we went on, they went on. So a lot of the experiences we had, they had. So, uh, you know, you don't really get to see that, that, that behind the camera see, uh, footage. Uh, especially uh, if you remember Rainbow Mountain, when we climbed up Rainbow Mountain. Like, that was a struggle. It was a, it was a tough mountain to climb. But they had to tackle that with all the camera equipment, the sound equipment. Uh, so my heart goes off to them for what, what they did and we, we, we almost became a really close-knit family uh, because we were in each other's pockets every day uh, every day um, so yeah it did get a bit get get a bit getting used to having a camera in your face and like talking about your feelings and stuff like that and um, you just got used to it I guess um, after a couple of days I just found it a bit odd but after that I just yeah just roll with it mm. well yeah I guess it gets to that stage where you are just ignoring it and um, I see that uh, somebody who hasn't seen the series but is watching yeah. asked, will it be repeated um, on BBC Two? I mean, 
it's actually on iPlayer, isn't it? I'm pretty sure it's on the BBC iPlayer and you can find it online. So do do That's go right. watch it straight after this. <laughs> we order yeah. you to. <laughs> um, Nine hours <laughs> worth. Yeah. <laughs> Great to see the questions coming in and we will be getting on to them. Now, to be frank, uh, Iman, you didn't, you and Jamil didn't get off to the most auspicious start, <laughs> did you? I think <laughs> the first episode very much felt, I mean, I, I was watching it as a keen traveller, you know, I'm trying to think, right, who's going to be the good ones here, you know, and uh, I've got to say, I didn't fancy you and Jamil as winners. There's no way I'd have bet on you two. Yeah. And uh, yeah, in fact, did you, did you even lose your map in the uh, very early on? But um, yeah, I think you were definitely the underdogs in that first episode. <laughs> I think. I think we, um, yeah. I, well, the first episode, we just um, when they dropped us off in in Mexico City, and then they're like, "Oh, this is where you go, and here's your map, here's your money. There you go." We're like, "What do you mean, there you go?" Um, like, do you know what I mean? You just didn't expect it. We just didn't know what to do, and we we're in like no man's land almost. We couldn't speak a word of yeah. Spanish, and we didn't have a clue what we, what we were doing. You know, um, if we just thought in the first leg, we, we we sort of like took it as like a holiday. You know what I mean? It's like holiday paid for by the BBC. No better, <laughs> nothing yeah. better than that. You know what I mean? So we, we we were just enjoying ourselves the first leg. We just enjoying ourselves, and um, then we realised, you know what? This is actually a race, and we need to get our act together. And that's when we started communicating better. And I think uh, through this series, you've probably probably seen the the relationship between me and my nephew change on how we we start, start communicating better and doing uh, better choices. Uh, was it 36 hours we were behind the first leg or something like that? Was something, something ridiculous. 33, uh, I double checked. Yeah. 33, <laughs> all right, sorry. <laughs> 33 hours behind in the first leg. So after the first leg, we just thought, you know what, this is going to be an uphill struggle, uh, uphill uh, struggle for us all. But yeah, it, it, was, it was good. It's sort of, we, need, we needed that at first, like, just to, you know, get our act together, really. Yeah. Well, I guess this is it, that um, not only were you not kind of perhaps used to that style of travel, like I say, you had travel, travelled a lot before, but not perhaps in that, that, quite that way. But, of course, also um, what did come over was that, although there seemed to be a genuine affection straight away between you and Jamil, but you were practically strangers to each other, weren't you? Yeah. We were, I think, like I said, it's 10 years that I spent away from the family and um, prior to the trip, the long, longest I've ever spent with Jamil was literally about half a day and I struggled with that. Mm. So to spend 53 days with him day in, day out was, was going to be a task in itself. Um, you know, mm. I, I, unfortunately, we're very similar in terms of like we love talking to people, we just love interacting with people. And um, that that's what got us through it because you know you can imagine the amount of people that we met on 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 the way and uh, especially on the buses like I'll be at the back of the bus like talking you know not even talking <laughs> because they can't speak English I can't speak Spanish we're just like communicating somehow with the random people and he was at the front yeah. of the bus doing exactly the same and we just like meet up in the middle you know we have to go through the whole bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, that st really started to come over that, as I mentioned at the start, you were communicating with people and you didn't see the others do it to quite that degree. Um, yeah. I think somehow you two were, despite the language barriers, you were just being very open, talking to people, weren't you? And, and that seemed to make a big difference. And was it on the third leg, I think, that... Uh, the one that you actually won. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, which was great. So, complete change. But so much of that seemed to be, I think, as well, because you had, you were communicating with people. You were getting inside info as you went along. Yeah, the communication was key. I think uh, that's the reason why we got ahead and that's the reason why we won. Um, I, I think prior to the trip, I always relied on my phone. That's what you do. You rely on your phone, Google Maps. Yeah you think what's the best option yeah. but what yeah. i realized is it the best option is it asking the people that actually live in the cities that take the buses day in day out i think they'll probably know better uh, about different routes and different ways of getting around than actual google the, uh, themselves and that's what i realized and, and when we figured that out uh, we ha you know that's when we started to get ahead of the game especially in that third leg it was some you know real good intel that we got from a, a local guy that told us Listen, the other teams have taken a certain route, which is not the best route. 
is another route that you can take yeah. around Colombia, and that's what we mm. uh, that's what we did, and that's the reason why we got ahead. Yeah, oh, that really paid off. And of course, after that, you went into Peru, and I think that fourth leg, it it yeah. was quite poignant. Uh, I mean, Peru seemed to really affect you. Um, yeah. It was some of the great footage as well. You've already mentioned about Rainbow Mountain, how tough it was. I mean, oh gosh, I was so worried for Jamil up there when he's oh, yeah. classic and he did it. It was <laughs> and tough. Then, oh, it looked it. And let be honest, when you got to the top, because um, you had to go and do this very steep, tough climb up and, you know, Obviously, there are other travellers up doing it, but the weather was terrible. It was snowing, it was sleeting, it was hailing. And then you're up at the top and you're saying, oh, yeah, this was worth it. Look, this is amazing. You couldn't see anything. It was snowing. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, um, I think it was, um, I think with the climbing, it was the, because we were climbing for about six, seven hours. And it's the whole anticipation of getting to the top, getting to the top. You can see it. Yeah. And it was like in the distance. I just, you just working to the top and you just got to make the most of it. Do you know what I mean? You spend seven hours of your life trying to climb up the mountain. Well, you got to understand, oh, I think no. on, that, on that day, uh, we just come off our 32 hour bus ride uh, down to Cusco and uh, the altitude was getting to us as well. So I've got to bear that in mind. Yeah, the altitude was hitting <laughs> oh, yeah. me as well. Yeah, the altitude again. Because uh, what made me laugh, because uh, I've watched that episode again, and I recommend anybody to. But, um, yeah, they've got lovely drone footage that's also been taken on a completely different day yeah. of Rainbow Mountain, you know, bask in sunshine with these beautiful colours. And then there's you and Jamil at the top. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Slow. <laughs> Can't see anything. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> it was anyway. good though. This <laughs> experience. Yeah, no, it's great, and I think it brings home that's to anybody who's travelled. I mean, that's true travel, isn't it? Exactly. It's yeah, not it's always as, as what, it's not always what it seems in the picture. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's not like postcard. No. Oh no, that was brilliant. Oh dear. But also in Peru, yeah, you um you went and did that day's work out with the fishermen on the traditional boats oh, yeah. and then you had the meal with them afterwards. And that was so touching. And and yeah. you talking about that father son relationship. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um I think in Peru what what we realised was that a lot of families, especially on the were on the buses and that's how we met the father and son. Uh, was on one of the buses, and then we started talking to them. And when we when they took us into the house, and uh, they showed us the types of fishing, and the bond that they had was just amazing. Um, I think, uh, like in a place like uh, Peru and Bolivia, uh, especially, the family unity is quite apparent, and it's it's amazing, and uh, it's something that you know I personally took for granted uh, as a as an indiv individual on on, the, on my perspective on how I was with my family. Um, it's uh, it's sort of brought everything in the home. How how important it is to have that unity, to have that bond. Uh, it was just incredible to see, and in some in some way, I sort of like wanted that myself. Yeah, yeah, it must have made you really think about it. And of course, um, on the I think it was the sixth leg, um, you and Jamil, you were by this time getting a lot closer. And yeah. Jamil did broach with you about what was the real story yeah. uh, um, about you kind of leaving the family. And yeah. um, I think, again, for us watching it, that, that was very touching when you talked about, well, basically it was because of love. Yeah, it was. Um, I think prior to that, uh, Jamil didn't actually know the full story. Well, he didn't know my story. And I guess I had the whole of, you know, 53 days to explain, explain it to him. And it was that point where he sort of got it. He sort of realised why I did what I did. And I had to do, do that as a, as a person and to fulfil my dreams. Um, and he was quite happy with that. And uh, he understood me as well. And after that, our bond got a lot closer. Uh, because mm. we were still in, like, no man's land, if you like, uh, with our relationship. But well, after that, we were, we were much closer. Yeah. Yeah, it, it did seem to really, as you say, give him an understanding, really, really yeah. touching. Um, are, are you still in touch now, you know, and, and what's we doing now? 
Yes, we're still in touch. He still rings me every couple of days. Uh, he's down in London um, doing like some architect thing. That's that's what he got his degree in. So yeah, he's doing well for himself. He's just uh, plodding on uh, with life. Um, I've actually seen him tonight uh, going for a, a run together. So that should be interesting. Uh, he's coming yeah. up to Bradford. Oh, great. Well, we'll we'll come back. I think I'm sure we'll uh, touch on the running in a bit because, of course, yeah. you are undertaking quite a big challenge at the moment. But meanwhile, back in South America, and gosh, I can't believe there's somebody watching who hasn't seen this program. You do. I'm seriously ordering you to go on to iPlayer after this and yeah. catch up on them all. They, they are so gripping. Um, but I think as, as it goes on through the different legs, the enormity of it, because I think, was it 25,000 uh, kilometres you were doing? And the whole enormity of it, your budget's running down, uh, you are thinking, because you guys were behind on budget nearly the whole time. Yeah, um, Yeah. so it's, if anything, it is getting tougher and tougher. Did it feel that way to you? I mean, were, were you ever concerned that you might not finish? Um, I think there was a certain point in Buenos Aires, yeah, it was Buenos Aires there, where I actually thought, you know what, we will... We, we were not going to make it to Mendoza. We just did not have enough money to, to get there. We looked at the map and we realised how far it is and the costings, and then we could barely just make it to Mendoza. Um, even hence, you know, after that checkpoint, we worked straight afterwards because we had to uh, to get onto the next uh, to get onto the next uh, part of the race. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it was more towards the end when you realise you, your budget is like really dwindling. Uh, you might not make it to certain places. Um, I think Brazil, we found Brazil to be really expensive in terms of travel. That's where, it, that's where our budget took the most impact. Um, and also, we, we, sort of, we didn't think that they would go all the way across Brazil either. Uh, because, you know, you, you can't not do South America and not see Brazil. So, I mean, it's such a huge part of it. And I'm so glad that we did do Brazil. It was incredible. Uh, but, yeah, the, the budget was, was crucial to us. And, you know, it was stressful as well. Uh, because you know, you know, one hand we didn't have enough money to travel, and the other one, on the other hand, uh, we yeah, we had to work to travel. But you know, if we had to work, we had to stop, and you know, we'd lose our place in the in the race. Uh, and that's what we did do in the seventh leg, where we actually lost our first place to second place because we had to work. No, exactly. And mm. obviously, as you say, you know, you'd been first in the previous leg, and and by this point, I think you you had become mm. strong favourites to win. But I've got to say, the, the working bits, they were some of the most interesting parts of the programme, frankly, because mm. I guess, again, it shows uh, the contestants, and, and I guess and particularly you know, yourself and Jamil, interacting with local people. Uh, how did you feel about, about the working? You know, was, was it an irritant that you were going to have to do this, or did, did you find it rewarding? Um, I found it liberating to be honest with you because you can imagine these long bus journeys that we did and then we had to work and the work sort of broke up a little bit it made the, the trip almost worthwhile because you know you know we'd race through like certain countries and we couldn't see certain places you know it's, but we had to work and the work sort of compromised for that because we got to understand the people the culture and what they're about and uh, in some of the instances we got fed like the traditional food and it sort of compromised us not seeing the sites. Uh, like in Brazil, you know, there's so many sites that we didn't see. Like, you know, you're talking a lot. Uh, but I, I guess meeting the families and traveling with them and uh, working with them, it really did it help us with that. And, you know, I found it liberating. I, I really did. And it's something that I'd, I'd love to do afterwards when I go on my travels. Right, we spend more time with, with local people in that same yeah. way and yeah. working with them. Yeah. Um, like you say, you did miss out on a lot of the sites. Was that frustrating? Oh, yeah. yeah, it was really frustrating. When I look back on the trip, it's probably my biggest regret uh, of some of the sites. And I think there was one point where, I think it was Costa Rica. We travelled through Costa, Costa Rica on a 26-hour bus journey. Uh, we didn't even stop in Costa Rica. We just literally just travelled through it. And, you know, Costa Rica is such an amazing country. And I, and I knew a bit about Costa Rica already beforehand. And I was so gutted about that. And that was my biggest regret, is, is not seeing a lot of the sites. Mm. Well, you can go back. <laughs> to, yeah. and I'm sure you will one day. Eventually. Yeah. Eventually. Um, as you said, Brazil used up um, quite a bit of the budget. And um, 
yeah, so the Brazil one, there was quite a lot of budget. You missed out on quite a few of the sites there. And sadly, we've lost Iman. We've got problems in Bradford. We're hoping to get Iman back in a moment. And uh, thank you for bringing your questions in, uh, putting your questions in the chat box. And uh, as soon as we've got him back, we'll be able to get onto those questions. And as I say, if you, even if you have seen the program, I do recommend going back and watching it again on iPlayer. And so while we're waiting for Emon, why don't we watch a video and uh, which shows a bit about the trip and also how it impacted him and what he's done since. It shouldn't be like this, man. It should not be like this. I wasn't on the race budget and this was my money. I'll give it all. And then I'll go to the closest bank and take as much as out I can. Last year, me and my nephew took part in the BBC's Race Across the World, where we raced across the whole of South America. We came across a lot of kids sleeping rough on the streets, and we were taken back by it. This year, I'm trying to raise £100,000 to try and build a school in Nepal with the charity Orphans in Need. With your kind donations and your help, I'll be able to fulfil their dreams. Please, guys, follow my link in my bio and donate where you can. Share my page, and let's get out there and let's make these dreams come true. Hi, Iman. Oh, gosh. Hi. So, uh, sorry, there seemed to be a technical blip there. But uh, it's great to have you back on. And it gave us an opportunity, obviously, to play the video. Because, of course, I was just getting on to the, the, the thing about Brazil. And yeah. obviously, Br Brazil, it's a um, beautiful country. As you said, you know, you felt it was a shame you had to miss out on so many sites. It was also the country that was most expensive and ate up a lot of your budget. But obviously, it let's probably changed your life in another yeah. way. Um, we saw you in Sao Paulo, and we just saw a little bit of it in the start of that video. So, can, can you um, describe to us what happened that day? Yeah, even watching your clip back, um, especially that little bit of footage that you've seen in Sao Paulo, uh, it all brings it back to me a little bit. Um, I think throughout the whole race across the world, we've seen a lot of poverty, a lot of kids sleeping rough on the streets. Um, I can give you a, a, quite a few stories of what happened in, like, in Peru and in Bolivia, uh, but it was even in Brazil where we actually came across these street, street children. And um, when I was there, I remember I said to them, uh, you know, I will come back and help you guys and I will do what I can. Uh, and, and that's what we did. Um, I think you probably know yourself in, with, with, with travel, you, when you go to these uh, deprived countries, you see a lot of poverty yourself. And it's like, that, it's like that phrase, you know, you've got to see it to believe it. You've got to see it to experience it. And that's what it was. When, it, when it's there stood in front of you, well, happening in front of you, you just can't, cannot ignore it. And that's what it was, and that's you know it got to all, it got to us all, not just myself, but my nephew, the whole team. Uh, so mm. you know, it was a an experience, and it was something that I'll, I'll live with for the rest of my life. Yeah, and so you obviously carried on and carried on down towards Ushuaia. You know, there were a couple of more legs to go. Was it playing on your mind? Was it you know, Was that staying with you? And and. Had you started to think about what you could do? Um, I think that was a turning point for us in the race. Um, I'd say up until then, we were 
treating it like a ho almost like a holiday that you know we were so fortunate to have these experience to be traveling like this and you know we made a choice that uh, me and my nephew you know if we were to win this up we'll donate the money and that's really spurred us on and that's where we thought you know what we have to win this uh, to do it for the kids and we have to you know uh, you know, donate that money to them because that you know that money will go such a long way in South America. In South America, it would be untrue. Yeah, <clears throat> and um, obviously us at home didn't know that, and so when we saw the last program, and what a gripping end, you know, you oh, were yeah. neck and neck with, with another pair to uh, to Inoshwaya to to make the finish. It looked like it was really close. I mean, was it as close as it looked? Where you literally, you know, minutes apart. Yeah. yeah, it was as and close then, as it looked. It, yeah. it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was incredible. I mean, with Jen and Rob, you know, they're the team that we came across the most uh, on the trip because you can imagine, like, all the contestants are running, doing the same, almost the same trip. So we'd bump into each other a lot, and you know, Jen and Rob, we've seen them a lot on the trip throughout the trip, and um, it was as close as, as that. Yeah, you know. Uh, like 20 seconds was the difference between us and them and it was just a, it was down to a foot race at the end oh that was incredible it was nail biting but then of course yeah. you made this wonderful announcement about how you're going to be donating the money so so what happened next you know what did you do to help the children um so yeah we finished the, sh the show and then that's when we decided to have, uh, give all the money uh, to sao paulo and when we came back to uk i got in touch with the charity that I came across in in Sao Paulo. So I approached them and I contacted them and I've been in contact with them ever since. Uh, I get like a weekly report of how the charity are doing with projects and foundations that they got going on. So I'm I'm really involved with, with everything that they got going on at the moment, which is which is what I wanted to be part of their lives. Um, so yeah, so we came back and we obviously gave them money over, and the the money that we sent over, we well, I we specified that we wanted to help street children because they had loads of projects going on uh, throughout the city mm -hmm. and throughout Brazil. But we specified we wanted to help the, the street children, and um, and that's what we did. And we we had some like videos and pictures back from the the from the charity to show how our money has been spent, which was amazing. Uh, you know, really really delighted with that. Oh, I bet, and uh, I presume one day it'd be wonderful to go over and actually take a look. But since then, you've actually gone a step further. You're, mm. you're undergoing a huge challenge at the moment to help children in a different part of the world. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, so um, I'm embarking on probably the biggest challenge of my life. Um, it's something that I've always wanted to do, is to build a school for orphans, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, so I'm hopefully go raise a hundred thousand uh, pounds with various char uh, with various challenges over the summer uh, which ultimately end with the london marathon at the end uh, so yeah a hundred thousand pounds to build a, a school from scratch uh, we've got the land in nepal uh, which is next door to an orphanage already uh, so i'm going to be there from literally from the first big brick being laid to the opening of the school so i'm going to be there for the whole process and it's something that I want to share with everybody. I want something that I want to everyone to get involved with. Um, so, you know, I'll, hopefully I'll be going over to Nepal uh, like at least once, twice a year, and I'd love to take people with me to experience. And, and you put, have you been in Nepal yourself, Lynn? Or yes, I have, but many years ago. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, I, I mean, actually, I went ten years ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So beautiful place, wonderful oh, yeah. people, but again, yeah, the poverty is. It's, really it's, it's shocking, and it, it, when I went ten years ago, and um, I was back in the you know backpacking days and the hostels, and the, and, and I loved everything about mm. Nepal. And I remember I, I came across one orphanage, just the orphanage I'm going back to, that I, I told them that I will come back and help them at some stage. And you know, I'm just using the basis of my race across the world success just to launch that. And uh, I was fortunate to do what I did on uh, race across the world and to have a big following online. And I'm just utilizing that to make people aware of what's happening in the world and to help as many people as you can. Uh, the amount of people that we can get through the uh, school, uh, educate them, especially with orphans where you know they don't have a chance in life. We just give the give, giving them a that start in start in life really. Yeah. So when you say that Jamil is going to be doing a run with you tonight, is that all part <laughs> yeah. of the uh, the running challenge you're currently doing? Yeah. 
So That's how do right. people find out more? You know, where, where should they go to donate? Um, yeah. And in fact, just to get more information. Uh, so um, I'm streaming everything online at the moment on my Instagram. Um, so my Instagram handle is just Emon Chowdhury and also my Twitter. Uh, I'm streaming online. Uh, our Just Giving page is justgiving.com forward slash run Emon run. Um, you know, you can donate as much as you can. Uh, you can share what, uh, the page. Uh, but I just love as many people to be involved in the project as well. As well. Uh, for me, to, for them to witness the them to witness the start of the orphan uh, for the start of the school to it finally being built uh, I'm doing a lot on Facebook as well so I'm, I'm constantly on my, my social channels as well and uh, um, I've got, obviously I've got Jamil running with me tonight and tomorrow I've got uh, Dom uh, you remember Dom from Race Across the World oh yeah he's, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he's, he's running with me and last week um, uh, Joe and Sam they didn't run they sort of walked around with me for a bit of the run yeah and that was nice so yeah Oh, brilliant. And that's wonderful that you've all kept in touch and, and also that yes. they're supporting you on this. So how fantastic. Um, so, yeah, so do look up Emon on social media to get the latest progress on that. And as he says on JustGiving.com, it's run, Emon Corp, run. And um, I'll make sure as well on Wanderlust social channels that we put some yeah. links up as well so um, people that, can find them. That'd be awesome. Uh, also about the run, uh, I forgot to mention it. I'm doing 200 kilometres during the month of Ramadan. Uh, Ramadan, we're obviously fasting 17 hours a day, so I'm doing seven, eight, nine kilometers a day after <laughs> fasting. So, no food and water throughout the whole day, and doing that run yeah. just to make it a little bit interesting. Yeah. <laughs> You're a glutton for punishment, Eamon. I'll say I that am. you don't make life easy for yourself, but uh, how, how brilliant! Okay, I think we should take some questions because we've yeah. had a lot in. So, let's have a look. Um, Somebody says, had you watched the race to Singapore before you did it? Um, I the first didn't watch it. No, I, well, I, I, never, I, never, I didn't watch it up until literally about three weeks before um, we went to Mexico City. And I didn't even finish watching it. I think I watched the, watched the first uh, four episodes. So I sort of had an idea of how the, the program works. But, um, you know, to Singapore, it was it's completely different to our trip. Uh, do you know what I mean? Because yeah. in South America, you probably know yourself. There's no trains at all, which is amazing. Which I find, you know, you know weird. There's no trains at all. Yeah. It's all bus yeah. journeys and boats. Yeah. No, absolutely. No, very different experience traveling there. Um, what was the scary, scariest experience that you had? Was there a scary experience? Um, I think there was a, quite a few scary experiences, but the most one experience was probably in the Daring Gap. Uh, to get through with the Daring Gap, uh, it's, it's a massive gap between Panama and Colombia and it's just dense forest. Uh, to get around it, you have to go on this like boat which is for nine hours and this boat is a very small, I'd say it's like a dinghy almost. And it's like you're on there for nine hours straight. And you know, it was some, some stage on that trip where I thought, you know, maybe we were going overboard and there was like eight people on this like little boat. Um, so yeah, it was that was that was a, a bit weird. And, uh, they did actually record it, but I didn't think they showed much of it. I think they used a lot of the drone footage uh, afterwards for that because we were all over the place that day. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I guess yeah. I think that'd be interesting, wouldn't it, to see the kind of the bits they've had to cut because I'm, I'm sure mm. there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Yeah. Um, a practical question from somebody. What happened? You've got a crew with you, but what happens, for yeah. instance, if there's only two seats left on the bus? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what did the crew do? So um, we had to make sure there was a minimum of four seats on the on the coach. Uh, so mm. basically, it was me and my nephew, and the, the two producers will always stay with us. Uh, the other guys, uh, they could get the next bus, or uh, well, they can get a taxi if they want to. Want to? In fact, they did get a taxi. To be fair, um, and they'll. Followers in the uh, on the bus, so we just had to make sure those four seats at all times for them. Yeah, yeah. So that's a, a, an extra headache that obviously we didn't see. Yeah, yeah. Um, we did actually. We, we, did actually we, we did actually miss uh, a few of the bus journeys because of that, because there was only like yeah. two spaces left. And they're like, sorry, you can't get it. Oh, that was really frustrating. Yeah. Oh dear. Um, who did you consider your biggest competitors? 
Um, initially, I, I thought well because uh, competitors were going to be Dom and Lizzie, uh, you know, blonde haired, blue eyes, you know, you know, people help him. Do you know what I mean? Uh, but I think later on we just realised Jen and Rob were quite quite savvy in the way they travel and the way they spent the money. Uh, then I think after Brazil we we thought you know yeah it'll be Jen and Rob that'll be our most competitors. Yeah, they they were very competitive, weren't they? And and yeah. very much managed their money. Uh, somebody asked, did you drink the coca tea in Peru? <laughs> this of yes, course did. Helps, uh, with altitude. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we did in Cusco. Uh, they gave us tools. It was, it was like a must. It's actually quite nice. Um, you know, I've, I've actually tried re replicating it here, but just, just can't. It's not the same, is it? No, <laughs> no, it's not. No, you've got to be there. And um, somebody said, "What did you discover about yourself on the journey?" Um, I think I discovered more about how important my my lifestyle is, how important my family is, and uh, what I take for granted. Um, I think when I came back to the UK, in that, especially with my, with my father, you know, I, I lost a lot of time with him and unfortunately he passed away in December. But I had, fortunately, I had about eight months with him before he passed away. And in them eight months, I, I made up a lot of time. I almost spent every other day with him, you know, spending time with him and, you know, just talking to him really. Um, and then, you know, prior to 10 years, I spent away from him. So I just realised, you know, how important friends and family are uh, and, you know, so you take that for granted. And also the small amenities in life, food, water, shelter, them three things, the stuff that we take all for granted. Uh, you, know, you know, there's millions of people in the world, around the world that, you know, haven't got them things. Um, especially with the kids, when we witnessed them, I, I always thought to myself, you know, what have I done to deserve what I've, what I've got? What have I done to be living in the UK with a roof over my head? And then what have these kids done? Do you know what I mean? It's just, it's just not fair. Um, so that's, that's, that's one of the reasons what's, what's inspired me to get uh, raising money and to help a lot of uh, children in the world because, you know, at the end of the day, the children, do you know what I mean? It's just shouldn't be, shouldn't be like that, to be fair. No, absolutely. And it sounds as if, you know, this, this programme, this series has made a la lasting impact on you. Yeah. Um, do you do you think it has? I mean, that that's that's wonderful. That's that story about um, coming close to your father. But um, do you think as well this is going to impact your life going forward? I think it has. Yes. Um, you know, race across the world was was, was amazing in, in so many respects. But the biggest thing that I'll get from it is having that idea or having that that realization of how bad it is in the world. Um, you know. At the moment, I just want to do as much as I can uh, to help others that are less fortunate. And, you know, mm. that's the best thing I've got from Race Across the World. It's just that, really. Yeah. Well, that has been so inspiring. Thank you so much, Iman. I mean, yeah. I was already a massive fan of the programme, and I'm sure everybody mm. watching was. But um, also, the, the impact it's made and the way it's helping as well now so many children in the world is... It, yeah. Um, incredible and, and so heartwarming. I might have to come to Nepal with you. I think. I think that, uh, oh, Lynn, that I'll, sounds incredible. I love that. I love that. Like I said, it's once the school's up and running, it's going to be an open invitation to anybody that wants to come. And the more Lovely. people that go over and experience it and help out in this school, even if it's anything that you can do, it doesn't really matter. It's just being there, being part of the journey, will be amazing. And um, yeah. it, it's in it's just outside of Kathmandu, so you know you've got a bit of bit of everything in Nepal, haven't you? You've got a bit of the historic side the culture the, the yeah. you've got the himalayan Heritage, mountains everything. Scenery, everything oh brilliant well let's just finish on that note then and we're going to play the video again so everybody can, as well yeah, can see you. that so thank you Imon. that was brilliant no problem thank you lynn <laughs> right.